Hi everybody, welcome. So welcome to the We Are Not Virus part two. My name is Moi Tran and it's my pleasure to be moderating the event this afternoon. So let's just uh, get some housekeeping rules um, in first. Uh, to avoid any technical issues and so that we can enjoy the event smoothly, um, let's all go through some of these points together. So firstly, if you can all please close all unnecessary apps and programs in order to aid the smooth running of the video content. If you move your cursor to the top right of the Zoom screen, there should be an icon with four corners which says full screen. Please click on this icon. Next to that button is another which says speaker view. If you click on that icon, you should just be seeing me on your screen now. In the bottom of your Zoom screen, there is a microphone icon which should allow you to mute or unmute, but please make sure that you're muted. Next to the mic icon is an option to stop your video. Please switch off your video mode, click on to hide non-video participants and select speaker view throughout the performance for best viewing experience. Finally, for any of you with access needs, we have live captions for this evening's performance but uh, we will be using closed captions for the performance. So the chat box will be disengaged until we go into the panel discussion, which should appear in the bottom navigation bar. So please click onto this to access the uh, captions for the performance. Um, the captions for the panel discussion will be on, will be rec uh, on the recorded version of this, uh, which will be online um, uh, after the event. Um, at the end of the video performances, there will be a five minute comfort break and then we will reconvene for the panel discussion. Um, I'd just like to tell everybody at this point that uh, this afternoon's events will be recorded. Um, so without further ado, this is We Are Not Virus. And the first piece is Conundrums by Amber Su, performed by Camille Malé Dijonet. Enjoy. The thing about viruses, before all this stuff about SARS-CoV, I swear, I never got sick. Not even a cough, not even a sniff, never even been asymptomatic. Which is kind of ironic, because all up and down town, people are looking around, people they see, picking out the ones they think look just like me, calling out, hey, Bob Dick, Jane and Cho, all the ones they think they know, saying, fucking Chinese, go back where you came from which is even more ironic because I thought we were all from the same kingdom. But hey ho, there you go. It's just another one of those conundrums. You get used to it when every day you live one. Besides, this stuff ain't new. It's been going on since day and minus one. But me, what do I care? I've never been sick, not even a cough, not even a sniff, never even been asymptomatic. And names, they don't mean a thing, right? Even COV's got a name that's kind of funny. One part, seriously? Two, on the money, because you know Corona is just dead Latin for crown. And every time I hear it, I think, damn nerds, you all just got clown. Running around trying to find a vaccine while all this time they're hailing this thing king. Man, those suits better keep digging and digging those graves deep. Because when the king is dead, it's long live the king, right? But hey ho, it's just another one of those dumb conundrums. And like I said, you get used to it when every day you live one. And me, what do I care? I've never been sick, not even a cough, not even a sniff, never even been asymptomatic. And names, they don't mean a thing, right? Take that girl called Jane, who only calls herself that name because that's how you play when your mother tongue is licked with shame. The thing about Jane was the way she sang. That night, she stood up there and held on to the light and said, right, the reason I sing this song, I'll never forget that time I was walking along alone one day after school. I was on my way home when they filled their backpacks with stones and beat me with them as I ran down the street and left me there in a sad little heap. I was just 11 years old when the tears ran down the blood of my cheeks. They wanted to break my bones, but these words, these words will save me. Then she sang her notes in that sad, sad tone, the kind that feels just you and her alone. Except there were crowds back then and all around the crowd was lit. But I just stood there like a stone, stoning to the side of it. I'd tell you her real name, but I'd rather forget, because that was then, and, and this is now, and, and who cares, right? It's just a name, right? Besides, that was the night I heard Jane liked Dick. Bob Dick, that is. Because Bob Dick, she said, Bob Dick gets it. 
Bob Dick used to work late nights at a takeaway shift. Until one night, this guy comes in and says, make it quick. Chop, chop, he says. Get it? No, said Bob Dick, he didn't. Or maybe he's just heard this joke so many times, he's sick of it. Either way, this guy goes livid, because nothing's worse than telling a joke no one gets, even if the joke was a bit shit. So the guy says under his breath, you chink. Except it wasn't like that. It was more like, you fucking chink. And he's blown his lid so hard and over the top, Bob Dick finally turns to him and says, stop which is as good as baiting a bear with a bat, because rule number one is you don't talk back. Because names, they don't mean a thing, right? It's just sticks and stones, right? Who cares if later that night Bob Dick gets hit over and over with a baseball stick until there's blood in his teeth, his nose and his lips. Even so, Jane still holds him and gives him a kiss. But me, what, what do I care? I've never been spat on, never been hit, never even been asymptomatic. And, and it's just names, right? Just sticks and stones, right? What kind of a name is that anyways? Bob Dick. Fucking Bob Dick who stole my chick. But besides, that was then, and this is now. And we're all supposed to be better anyhow. Right? Except, all up and down town, people are looking around at the people they see, picking out the ones they think look just like me. Calling out, hey, Bob Dick, Jane, and Cho, all the ones they think they know, saying, get out of here. Go home, you fucking Chinese. You people are filthy, you people are fleas, you people are dirty, you people will eat anything. You're a fucking disease. You make me sick, we don't want you here. Get out, leave. And all up and down town, people are saying it and saying it. And all up and down town, I keep hearing it and hearing it until all I see are people like Bob Dick and Jane and me getting battered and bruised and blamed and beat. I see Jane get slapped, I see Bob Dick get hit. I see Jane getting whacked with an umbrella stick. I see Jane get punched. I see Bob Dick get pushed. I see Jane getting kicked with an iron foot. I see Bob Dick fall. I see Jane get shoved. I see the world getting crushed and crushed and crushed. Until all I can see now are Jane's crying and crying. And all I can hear now are Bob Dick's dying and dying. And it's like they're screaming and screaming my name out loud. And it's all coming down on me, this drowning sound. And inside my chest, it's starting to twist and squeeze. And I think, fucking hell, this fucking disease. It's finally got me and now I can't breathe and I think I need to call a doctor, I need to call someone I know, but the only people I know are Bob Dick, Jane and Cho, and no way am I going to call Bob Dick who stole my chick or that girl called Jane I'm still trying to forget. So I, I called Cho and what do you know? He answers. And he says, friend, what's on your mind? And so I tell him how it is. How I've never been sick, not even a cough, not even a sniff, never even been asymptomatic. But there's something inside me now. It's tearing up my lungs and twisting my heart. And I'm thinking now, I'm done. Because something's happening to me, Cho, and I don't understand it. And he says, friend, now is not the time to panic. Now is the time to be calm and focused, vigilant and collected. And to know that even if you have never been sick, even if you have never had any symptoms, it does not mean you have never been affected. And I say, calm uh, and focused. Vigi what and collected? Man, I don't know how much longer I can stay like this because all I can hear now are people dying and dying and all I can see now are people crying and crying and all I want to do now is scream and scream. So tell me honestly, Cho, how much longer until a vaccine? And he says, friend, here it is now, the truth and reality. There are so many improbabilities in the science of disease that you must consider the very probable probability that there may never in fact be a vaccine and that you might consider your future with this virus accordingly. And I say, fuck, Cho, you, you gotta be kidding me. And I can feel my chest tightening again with a squeeze. Fuck this King Kong of a virus thing. We gotta suppress it and kill it, destroy it, destroy everything. But then Cho says, friend, do not worry, all will be all right. But here it is now another truth and reality. There is no more cure than there is ever only disease. But disease is a part of being human and humanity. Viruses are responsible for half the evolution of human DNA, the biggest driver we have ever known of biological change, an inescapable part of all nature and our future history. For there are more viruses in a sink full of ocean water than fish in the entire sea. And every time the clouds on this earth weep, we are washed with a rainfall of viruses from the sky. But there are more viruses than stars by a hundred million times. But 
Viruses are the most plentiful thing on this planet by abundance and have been infecting all forms of life since life first commenced. The important thing to remember, friend, is that this disease is another moment in time to adapt and survive and ask ourselves, just who do we want to be? And I said, fuck me. All this time show, I thought you were just a doctor, but here you are pounding it like an old school philosopher. Friend, Cho says, in the roots of all science are the seeds of philosophy, the sum of which is greater than just you or me. Take the ancient Greek roots for the words symptomatic, sin and pipto, meaning together I fall. Think about it. And then the phone clicks. And I think, damn, no, then there is something like poetry. And then I think, fuck, holy shit. This virus isn't just about me. This virus is about the whole of humanity, about life, society, and basic human decency. Fuck all this, forget about the rest. Fuck all this, all about me. Fuck this cult of hyper-individuality. Fuck every time I did nothing and just stood by, because every time I did, a little piece of me died. Because sometimes it's easier to forget the place where you come from than remember how it is to be something called human. But that was then, and this is now, and, and now is our chance to change everything, right? To, to shake this world raging with disease and ask ourselves, who do we want to be? Because every time I hear a cough or a sniff, every time I hear someone got spat on or hit, I think of Bob Dick, Jane and Cho, and all the people whose names I don't know, even the ones who look nothing like me. And I think, I get it. I feel it. Right here, inside. For I am them and they are me, and I know that just sounds like another conundrum of a thing, but the thing is, conundrums, they mean everything, right? Because all up and down town, people are calling around to the people they know and the ones they don't, saying we're tired of the sticks and the stones and the names. We're tired of the fear and the hate and the blame. Let this be the moment we choose to live stronger. Let this be the moment we say no more, no longer. Let this be the moment we build a brave new kingdom and write a new history under a brand new conundrum. For together we rise, when together we fall. Each one of us kings, each one for the all. Cabbage. Part each leaf, salt liberally. Rub in. It's preaching to the choir, I think. Cabbage in a bowl, let sit for two hours. Massage the cabbage every half hour. It's preaching to the choir when I think. In the meantime, Rice flour and water, I used corn flour. Stir over a low heat until you get a porridge. When I think, it's just a game. Leave to cool. I always have odds and ends going off in my fridge. Half a daikon and a packet of nearly gross bean sprouts. Cut your daikon into coins. Rinse your bean sprouts, pick out the mac. Everything dies. Money burns. I don't have um, kachukeru, so I use a mix of Sainsbury's red and ancho chili flakes. Ancho chili has a deep, almost smoky flavor. Give something red chili can't. Depth, maybe? Peel and crush your garlic. Uh, ginger. Wonder if ginger can go through a garlic crusher. Clean the cupboards of ginger that's sort of splattered everywhere because nope, ginger cannot be crushed in a garlic crusher. But it's not just a game. When I watch my friend's nephew get screeched at, he's four and he's popped his Nerf gun, bright orange, bullet to my chest. I feel like I'm preaching to the choir when I think, he's four, and I try to laugh it off because why would you shout at a kid for playing a game? He's four, and he's cute, 
and his dad's in the military, loves to show his kid all these games, pixels on a screen, faceless enemies, ammo running out, shoot them in the head. He's a sweet kid, really sweet, thinks the world of everyone, thinks everyone's his playmate. Took to me real quick, ducked out from under the couch to shoot me in the heart. I uh, only had a bit of shrimp paste left, so I used some oyster sauce. Crustacean is a crustacean. Though, I think an oyster is a bivalve, actually. So next time he tries that shit, raises his fake gun, aiming at his new buddy, and that new buddy isn't some teenager on the reservation, isn't some kid from round the block. Turns out his new buddy's a cop. He's four, and he's cute. And that's not stopped them before. And I think I'm preaching to the choir when I think that you haven't thought of this before is a privilege. Half an hour, massage the cabbage. That I hadn't thought of this before was a privilege. Cabbage, round this time, thinly slice, heavily salt. Pound and massage. We are not a virus. So old, it's boring. If not in words, then in thought. Until there's enough brine, it covers the cabbage. It's preachy to think, I think, that it's a privilege you think it's not. You're gonna want to put the cabbage in a jar, weighed down by some weights or some pebbles. I usually use a smaller jar filled with water, mustard seeds, or caraway crowd or onion seeds. It's a privilege to choose not to be political, to choose not to care. Half an hour, massage your Napa cabbage. Should be shriveling real nice by now. Grapefruit. Breakfast this morning, covered in sugar. Take the rinds, scrape the white from the peel. The white's where the bitter is. You just want the yellow of the skin. I mean, that one's a given. If they're waxed, dunk them in some boiled water, give them a scrub. Small saucepan, equal parts, water and sugar. Slice the peel up fine. <clears throat> Heat until syrup turns thick on the back of the spoon, passes the smear test. Marmalade enough for tomorrow's breakfast. 30 minutes, massage your Napa cabbage. Mango, three for a pound at the Asian market. Just too dry, never not green. Hot skillet, mustard seeds, chili powder, methi seeds if you have them, fenugreek powder if you don't. Crushed garlic, use whatever you have left in the house. Rough chopped mango, peel and all, and what? What are you going to buy in your lifetime that's worth more to you than your own humanity? I think I'm preaching to the choir when I remind my friends. You begin to forget, sometimes, that the world can be kind, dazzling and warm and mesmerizing and sweet. Remind them of a world of victimless comedy, of laughter that's easy, because it's hard and I get angry so quickly. <clears throat> Mango, bloom spices, salt, garlic, a neutral oil. Mix it up, slap it in a jar. 30 minutes. I think. Final massage. Napa should be real shriveled by this point. Remember you're growing spring onions on your windowsill? Sprouts from ends you didn't throw away? Spring onions, pick a couple, slice diagonal, and then just chuck them into your bivalve rice slurry mixture. Rinse your cabbage well. Under each leaf, get the salt gone. I just feel like I'm preaching to the choir because my friend recommended running, or at least a daily walk, but I don't live in an East Asian area. North London, Jewish, South Asian, Polish, Turkish, I think. Collindale, a bit further south, a huge Chinese supermarket, but not on my street. I'm just, I'm kind of just scared.
to go for a walk. Excuses in my back pocket like a passport. Passport itself, I wonder. Would that protect me? Should that protect me? But you all know this. Nothing surprises us. Just anger. Anger recycled. Preaching and preaching this hatred on repeat until we know nothing but the fermentation of race and virus and privilege until all I know to talk about with you all is this. We are not a virus. This anger and this hatred and the frankly unreasonable fear that anyone would take time out of their Wednesday afternoon to beat me up in a Sainsbury's car park. Except it happened to my friends and so I feel like I'm preaching to the choir but once washed, pat dry and then cut into bite-sized chunks. Mix it all up in your vegetables and rice and slurry bivalve, everything. Really get in there with your hands. Rubber gloves if, you know, you're a wimp. It doesn't like your hands to smell of garlic and the, the NHS can spare them. Large jar, mine used to have olives in it. Really pack the kimchi down, make sure the brine covers it, and then weigh it down with a bag of rocks. Couple of days for the kimchi and the sauerkraut, and the same for the mango achar. So much kimchi and kraut in fact that I'm actually struggling to eat it. Alone in my flat with my jars of pickle. Getting angry at Twitter, getting angry at everything. I think it's maybe not the choir I need to be talking to. You'll want to burp your kimchi in your kraut every day. The uh, buildup of gases, expending pressure against the jar. Images of glass shards. Not Kachikaru bivalve slurry slitting your neck. What a cause of death. Burp it. It won't explode. <laughs> Three days fermentation. Taste it. Keep it in the fridge. Browning fruit and leftover vegetables. Making stock for jigae and jigae and jigae and... Using the second rice rinse as a milk substitute in sauces and... Keeping the pasta water for bread and radish tops to grow salad and using this anger as fertilizer, not recycling it back out at us, by us, for us, but this anger and hatred turning to self-hatred and self-harm, but anger into growing radish tops. Anger into massaging Napa cabbage. Anger into recipes. Anger into kneading bread to spread my grapefruit marmalade over. It's preaching to the choir, but I want you to know this anger is here. And anger is useful, I think. I'm just conscious of where my anger is going. Soon anger into... Where do I start? But for now... Anger into kimchi. Anger into kimchi, and anger into kraut, and anger into jam. And anger into making me, we, us, who are, thrive. Because what makes them angrier than seeing me all good? Seeing me look after me for me. Of us, for us. Yeah. 
For now. For now. It's not their fault. If not for our leaders, what am I doing here? I can tell by his accent that Jabisco is Nigerian. Plus the fact he told me he's Nigerian. It's because of our useless leaders that the Chinese can treat us like shit. Look at me, a full grown man with wife and children working to feed my family. I came here to do business. Is that my crime? How long have you been living on the streets? ever since I arrived in Gangzhou three weeks ago. The police came to my hotel room and threw me out. The law says you should go into quarantine for 14 days. Oh, I'm supposed to quarantine myself when they threw me out of my accommodation. His question statement comes at me with such sarcastic force that I pause before I ask him another question. Jibisco looks at me like I'm truly a moron. Hi. I say to the other three guys sitting on the pavement with their belongings, all looking at me with the same contempt as Jabisco. So I repeat my question. Where are you sleeping tonight? Mr. Man, have you not already confirmed your stupidity? Leave this place before I stone you! I was kind of trying to... I don't know, that I didn't see the bedding that was laid out on the ground behind them. I'm sorry. Let me buy you guys something to eat. Do you like Mackey D's? There's one across the road. Why did I say that? Guilt complex? Anyway, they look at me, then at each other and laugh like I told a joke. Jabisco then says, why not? And they give me their order along with their exaggerated appreciation. I'll be right back. I cross the street. The night is busier now that some of the restraints have been lifted, but not busy enough for the burger joint to have, say, more than around three people in it. I'll be in and out before you know it. I might even still get to work before Deng. If I don't, no worries. It's all for a good cause. As I get to the door of the McDonald's, the customer service assistant at the door blocks my way. Excuse me, I say to her, but she points to the sign on the door. Black people are not allowed to enter the restaurant. I look at the assistant. Nikai Wan Xiao! Another assistant, a big lad, comes over to join her. Go away! Go away! And then I hear the boom of laughter behind me from Jabisco and his crew. Look at him! Idiot! Don't mind him, he thinks he's better than us! Their mocking laughter rings in my ears as I make my way down the street. I don't want to walk past them, so I take the back route. We'll add 10 minutes to my walk, but as usual, I'll be over an hour early. I guess I won't be dang to the office this time. I run into a batch of police officers, forcing a group of protesting Africans out of their flats and onto the street. I recognise Officer Chang. He nods to me as I pass by. I nod back. I get to the end of the street before Shane makes me turn around to look. The Africans are being shoved away from their former abode. I should go back and talk to Chang. He's a reasonable guy. Then one of the Africans shouts, We are not Uyghurs! Why are you treating us like this? The office is as busy as it can be when you're all keeping social distance. My producer, Biyu, waves at me by the photocopier. I've been summoning up the courage to ask her out before... You know what, shot everything down. She puts the document she was copying on the table for me to pick up. All I can say is, how's your mother? Better than yesterday. <laughs> now I'm hearing sarcasm in everyone's voice because I asked her the same question yesterday. Before I can reply, she's gone and Deng walks in. I tap my watch at him triumphantly. Please, you beat me today only because the police are picking up people who broke the quarantine. I had to take the long route. I don't know why people cannot obey the law. They're being thrown out onto the streets. What do they expect? 
Deng had studied journalism in New York for two years and worked there for three before returning to China. I've been round to his house a few times, and he'd been round to mine. But to throw them out into the streets, where will they go? I heard they were told to stay indoors for 14 days, and they didn't. I'd never seen this side of Deng before. This hard, uncaring side. There's a sign in McDonald's, no blacks allowed. You don't eat at McDonald's. What were you doing there? The point is, it's racist. In all the years you've been working here, you've never given a thought to Africans. Suddenly they're your bro? Guilt complex. complex. Fuck you, Deng. Fuck you too. I'm not sure where the anger is coming from, whether from tonight's events or from the fact that Deng was telling the truth about me, not giving a shit about anything I didn't care about. Or the fact that we both knew who the they were we were referring to. I could easily be one of those people. If my parents hadn't gone to study in the UK and decided to stay, you'd be talking about me like that. I have nothing against Africans, but they're posting shit about China on social media. Wow. In all the years I've known him, Deng has never displayed any sense of nationalism. We were on lunch break together and he once told me nationalists are people who lean on the past glories of their ancestors. They have very little to offer the future. I thought, like minds. We never made them slaves, never colonized them. We're pouring money into the place, creating equal partnerships they could never have with the West and we're the most racist nation on earth? Fucking ungrateful. So what, you think what they're saying about your lot is propaganda, 100%. They're only doing America's bidding, trying to undermine us. We're both animated now. Everyone in the studio is listening. And for the first time since I came to China, I feel vulnerable. Here in this supposedly liberal space, I'd called home for six years. What is going on between you two? I don't want to know. Stop arguing and get ready for me to count you down. BU's intervention is the cue for Deng and me to come to our senses. Especially me, since I'm not political. I don't have the information at my fingertips to stand toe to toe with Deng. So, what's your government doing, if not propaganda? I ask him as I order my papers and check my laptop. What are they doing, if not refusing to see the blatant racism that's going on around them? So, you didn't get served in a fast food joint, and now the whole of China is racist? I have a better idea. Tell your newfound brothers to stop coming here. Tell them to stay in Africa and develop the place. That'll solve a whole lot of problems. There's a collective exclamation. <gasps> a while back before the lockdown, we've been discussing a report on China building the new African Union headquarters. Deng asked me innocently, or so I thought at the time, what it would take for Africa to develop like China. I tried to act like I cared and said, Africans should stay in Africa and develop the place. That'll solve a whole lot of problems, I said. Then you lot should stay at home and not spread your fucking virus around. Take responsibility for your actions. Stop blaming Africans, you fucking chink. His hand movement is so fast, I think he's about to land me one. Instead, he brings out his mobile phone and shows me a picture of his sister, Chinwa. She's in her second year at uni in Birmingham. Her face is battered and bruised. She sent me this last night. She was walking home from class when a gang of boys attacked her, broke her cheekbone. She's lucky to be alive. She's afraid to go out. Attacks like this have been increasing against us. She did nothing wrong. Why attack a defenseless girl? I'm going to say, why attack defenseless Africans? But I can see the hurt in his eyes. I don't know what else to say, so I stay silent. I start thinking about how we got to this point, how one moment I could think of myself as a nice guy who can be slightly up his own arse into calling a mate by a slur. It's like both of us were infected by something contagious. You know, I'll, I'll apologize and see where we'll take it from. What life in Wu? Si, san, er, e. This is the evening news. The headlines. President Xi Jinping says the people of Hong Kong are very happy with the new security laws.
when the 9-11 attacks happened, I knew it was going to be people of my race that got the blame. And now with COVID-19, it's people of my, when, what I mean is when the 9-11 attacks happened and I knew it was going to be people of my religion that got the blame. And now with COVID-19, it's people of my race. And I can only think, here I go again. Like, I grew up in a conservative Muslim background, but I don't always wear the hijab. For most Muslim women, it is a choice. And I choose to represent my religion as diversely as I can. And well, hijab and niqab takes ages for me to do. But that's just me. Kudos to all the sisters out there who can get their modest outfit ready quicker than this vain bastard. Like, they just whip that headscarf around their heads and boom, ready to go. Like people say, oh, your hair's so silky and spend loads of money on hair extensions labelled as Chinese hair, or they iron it with some bright pink GHDs. Like I watch those Pen 10 adverts and I'm just like, that's my damn hair every day. <laughs> Once I was at this hairdresser's and they tried to con me into straightening my hair even more. Like seriously, straighten these locks. And I'm anything but straight, honey. Don't tell the God Squad though. They've got enough problems handling heterosexuality. Now I've been kicked out of gay venues before for looking too feminine or too straight or just not white enough. Apparently us Asians are too geeky looking for pretentious, sorry, cool venues. I was accused of being a DVD seller at one gay bar. Queer gold-skinned icons are few and far between. Straight people are funny with me as well. Men and women think I'm after their ass. I suppose they've got to build up their fragile ego somehow. But have you ever tried Googling bisexual orientals? Stuff of nightmares. The weird thing is all that desperate, cheap porno material just reeks of desperate heterosexuality. Not that I'm against straight people, but you know, maybe they should keep some things to themselves. Like butch, femme, whatever. I'm proud of the way I look. It's what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given me. Nowadays, like with the COVID-19 crisis being blamed of people of my color, my, I shape my hair that doesn't need straighteners. I've got to be careful, especially when I go out. Not wearing a hijab with a face like this leads to some of my fellow Muslims claiming that I have passing privilege. Some people don't even think I can be Muslim because of my race. All society sees is this Chinese or Japanese woman. It's that same society that thinks Muslim women shouldn't wear the headscarf that makes me wear it now. So perhaps I should thank Boris for making me look more religious. Before the COVID crisis, my hijabi relatives, some are darker skinned than me, would get weird looks or people being rude to them in public. And in rural areas, they'd take the hijab off or replace it with a hat. Like for 20 years now, I've had to put up with people slagging off my religion and abusing my fellow Muslim kin. And it's all too easy to say, well, just don't be Muslim then. I can't do much about my gender, sexual orientation or race. My religion is my choice. And being a Muslim of East Asian and Southeast Asian heritage, so having that passing privilege, leads to my own religious brethren making comments like your people are so liberal like it's a dirty word my ethnicity is treated like a holiday destination on racial diversity forms we don't exist the biggest muslim country in the world is in the far east a long history of female imams doesn't count. We used to have female Quran reading competitions, and Zhang He rarely gets a mention. A seven foot Muslim eunuch and a sea commander with a fleet that would have dwarfed the Spanish Armada apparently isn't memorable enough. 
And then there's the millions of Chinese Muslims put in rehabilitation camps. I wonder if their homelands in China were in tourist destinations, whether they'd be suffering in silence then. I've been accused of eating dogs and cats. Then it was lectures on how cruel halal meat's supposed to be. I'm betting it's going to be questions about halal bat soup next. And I'm supposed to be used to this. I'm supposed to be used to people telling me to go back home to countries I've never even been to. I'm from Sussex. I'm supposed to be used to people speaking to me in languages other than English. I'm supposed to be used to, to being walking target practice because my identity is too soft to fight back with imaginary karate kicks. I'm not. I don't like being pigeonholed as, as a scientist or doctor because my race is so brainy. And then being told I'm the reason for the pandemic. I dread to think what our brainy medics and public workers of my race are going through right now. If they're not being ignored, they're being hated on. And I don't like that members of my family are being racially profiled in settings where they're more likely to be infected because the first safety measures were to, to cancel Asian takeaways and hoard toilet paper. I don't like this mind fuckery where I'm told to be more British by being free to be who I want. When largely this is who I've chosen to be. I find it quite ironic really that when I do the most English thing, which is to complain, that I get told to fuck off to whatever country. Nor do I appreciate being told what country I should consider home. Like, do you know what? This isn't just where I was born and raised, so you can fuck off to whatever country too, seeing as you suggested it in the first place. Oh, and it's not flattering when some creep thinks me delicate and submissive and docile. Like, you think these are nice stereotypes? You try being on the receiving end when you're getting the shit kicked out of you. Especially if you're a mum with a kid or a geriatric or a young un, and then top that off the, with the risk of getting queer bashed. Like, apparently, we should be grateful that we're invisible enough to the point where any abuse we do get is just met with, oh, well, that's terrible, but at least you know how it feels instead of being the model minority. It's basically a gloat from people that think they're anti-racist. It's just a lazy stick up their ass. Mm. Yeah, so put me on a guilt trip for having a job. Like I have to work twice as hard as a white person to keep a roof over my head. And yeah, tell me again, like my elders did, that I should follow my culture and keep my mouth shut because apparently our language sounds funny and we shouldn't rock the boat. I mean, after all, it's what got us into this fine mess in the first place. The blind eye turning of, a, of the deaths of an unscrupulous race from a mystical China virus. So yeah, you know, please sing the, the praises of exotic New Zealand, but don't forget her neighbours, Vietnam, Taiwan and Brunei have lower death tolls from COVID. Once lockdown's over, there are gonna, it is gonna be open season for racist scumbags and they'll be gunning for the blood of East and Southeast Asians. Meanwhile, the media will carry on reporting on the, the suffering of animals thousands of miles away like how, how flattering to know that the lives of you and your loved ones are of less value than a, a, a tropical flying squirrel. Dehumanising much? Who cares? Welcome me to the club. I've got VIP membership.
you can easily change a hijab or a niqab or take it off. You can't do that with a face. Okay, <clears throat> I'm going to give it a go then. Oh, um, I'm going to be doing some yoga. Is that going to be a problem? I honestly don't know, to be honest. I don't even know how to work this stuff. and There's a lot of words in it. I don't even get through it all, to be honest. Uh, it's not going to make too much noise, is it? I don't know. I mean, what are you doing? I'm doing my thing. None of this fucking idiot. Okay, um, you can shut me in now, I think. Okay, mind your feet. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Now, see, this is the thing. You see, I used to do, like, theatre on stages, and now I'm live and direct in my cupboard from Labrook Grove, West London, with Jennifer doing yoga class in the background. And it's like, I make this. This is like a store cupboard, you know? I, I nail duvets and pillows to the walls and I mean, try and soundproof it, but anyway. Right, I'm just going to do my best. I've got no idea if this thing works. I don't know what this button does. I don't know. I'm probably going to fuse the national grid here, but here we go. This is my thing. There's a time to cry, but that time is not now. There's a crime to be faced, and this is not how. There's a way to be found, but it's not Tao. For the day to be won, we need to avow. You see a contagion. You make an equation. You fear an invasion when it's your evasion. You decided I'm virus based on a bias. So you flip the stylus to the groove of a chorus that's desirous of the iris of that bile that inspires us to find hate in a crisis and not be the wisest. Instead, faux pious and blame in a highness that's really just slyness in the dryness of a minus that signs up for crimes that align us all eyeless with a tyrant's malignness that won't dignify us and leaves us wireless. Hope, not hate, we would hope is our fate. But the rope came too late, and the trope is our state. No matter how dope is our bait, our scope wasn't great, and our slope wasn't straight, we won't cope with this weight. The deadly contagion is my face. The crucial equation is my race. You see an invasion of your space, but it's your evasion with no trace. Locked down in Plague Town, I see a fool and it's the common noun. You want a showdown in Shantytown, it's not your playground, so you melt down. You looked round like Cain for someone to blame that you could defame and you chanced on a game that required an aim that you couldn't attain so you lashed at the strain and you howled in the rain at the link in the chain you didn't think was the twain that you could rename because it wasn't the same and just wouldn't be rained so you cast your pain and made your frame and cooked your own chow mein composed a refrain in the poem of methane that was made on the plane of your prejudice and shame and my brother is crying now he's standing there bruised and bloodied and perplexed misused and muddied on a bogus pretext. He's been called by a name he didn't even know, forced to confront what he didn't want to own. And salt tears flow now. He scarcely could imagine, didn't think it was possible, couldn't see it was credible, never reckoned with this outcome. And hurt tears flow now, and cruel fears grow now, and harsh winds blow now, while hurt tears flow. Ow! You okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, it's just the, the noise of the headphones. Hey, he he's saying about suing you. What? Why does he Why does he want to sue me? Because you called him a disgrace. Yeah, I said in in you know as far as we're concerned, it's like in our opinion. What's man? That the whole world's burning down. You know, we're all in lockdown. Everyone's dying. I mean, really, this I can deal with this fuckery. Listen, I'm already on this. This is, this is starting to sound good. Yeah, shut shut the door again. I'll see. Huh. I, I can't be bothered to deal with him. Okay, all right then. Oh, where was I? Oh yeah, that's right. I've been congratulated in the past on my community and its quietness and politeness. The fact we're not pesky troublemakers like those other people of colour. That we keep our heads down and graft. That we don't cause a fuss or demand the lead role in the prime time. That we don't politicise, unionise, criticise, liberalise, signalise. That in fact we acclimatise and epitomise good migrant values. That we're symphonised and syncretised and syllabised and lionised as placid and culturally civilised and visualised in an obedient, idealised paradigm. That we don't be victimised. That we allow us stigmatised. That we accept trivialised happily dehumanized but never criminalized, that we symbolize hardworking, uncomplaining, hypnotized, pacified and cast aside as a devitalized, exoticized, normalized, privatized, ancient wise culture that will cicatrize in silence, are minimalized in compliance, nullified in alliance and simonized as reliant. That we should be proud to be so untroublesome. But I'm not proud of that. In fact, I'm ashamed. 
I'm ashamed of the fact that we won't raise our voice. I'm ashamed we don't act or exercise our choice. I'm inflamed by our tact and that you can rejoice in our feigned lack of boldness and breakage and noise. That tamed little pact we signed as your convoy to stay muted and packed and making buck choy. To remain in a tract of docile employ, yet weaponized, enacted when you chose to deploy us to beat down on black people you casually destroy. You proclaim us your bracked little bottleizing carboy, your lame and cracked ideal minority McCoy, maimed and stacked like washed up dipnoy. No. So fuck your model minority card. I never wanted it anyway. It didn't get me in your club. It deflated and frustrated and truncated and outdated and vacated and castrated and deactivated and antiquated and cultivated and desecrated and dissipated and dominated and understated and moderated and mutilated and fabricated and orchestrated and obliterated and obligated and insulated and implicated and nauseated and mutilated and regulated and fabricated and flagellated and conjugated me into a component model of celestial remove and promulgated me as your handy hard roof and nominated my name as a Refutable proof, integrated me into the chorus of disapprove, decorated my reticence, devoided my groove, terminated my soul and my right to choose. But I was born and raised in the ugly wild west, and I was anointed and baptised in the flame of punk rock. The great Joe Strummer wrote a lyric in a song he called White Riot. Black man got a lot of problems. But they don't mind throwing a brick Asian kids go to school So where's our brick? Give it to me. I'll pick it up and hold it and swing back and fling it and hurl it and throw it into the heart of this hate, into the mart of this fate, like a dart that inflates our part in debate and ignites art from this state, a sudden spate that relates and shatters and matters and scatters and swaggers, is real made of steel and unseals us with zeal and spiels off our will and heals and not kills. I saw you standing on the street. You were crying and bleeding and your eye was puffed up like a hurt boil. You couldn't understand, you couldn't relate in this hinterland, it just didn't equate, it wasn't part of the plan that in your substrate state you'd sink in the quicksand and choke on this trait. You say it breaks your heart and leaves you crushed and bereft. It's stolen your faith like the worst act of theft. You call it ignorance, but trust me, they know what's what. They just picked on you now because you suit their rot. No conservative tones will ease this malaise. They don't do it because they don't know better. They made a choice. They do it to indulge and wallow and rejoice in their rage and their spite. They couldn't target their fight. And they've been suckled and nurtured and unleashed as a mite. There's no moral compass or leadership that's right. Except in the far sense, so that's a dimming of the light. There's no one to turn to, no top-down respite. So you have to know it that long is this night and hard is this fight. And dying is our light when we need to burn bright and ignite and incite. Be outright, not alt-right and not make common cause with a mighty government a long way away that crushes its people into submission and incarcerates minorities in the name of stemming division and surveils its citizens and curtails their dissidents and says that we're different, our rights insignificant. All we care about is material, all else is ethereal. And maybe they did cause this bacterial affliction, but I won't collude in their mythical fiction. And I won't cheer on Boris and like Nadine Doris demand that I do, because I'm not your fool and I'm not the weaponized race of the Chinese Communist Party. I won't give any face except demand the space to say loud and clear. There is not a bone in my body that is patriotic, but I'll sing an anthem for the human race if you'll let me. So brother, don't cry and don't ask why. Learn to decry and don't deify because attempted forbearance is plain acquiescence. You think you can educate, but some viruses do discriminate and they don't predicate in a way you can militate and influence or deviate when all they want is to eliminate, bifurcate, obliterate, devastate and dominate empowered by the fourth estate who they emulate and imitate led by a braying cannon of Hopkins and Farage and Yaxley Lennon of a Sunday night TV star who thinks it's all boring but hires a lawyer to ensure that he's scoring tanked up with cocaine and righteous omnipotence spying in white lash grift of fecund auspiciousness while an anti-Semitic conspiracy brews and Muslim migrant blame ensues and Africans walk the streets homeless in the province of Guangzhou while we're in the crosshairs of the nationalist crossbow and Trump says it's Chinese, Chinese. a racialized disease 
and praises white men with guns on his free state streets who take up his mantra of willful caprice. While CCP wolf warrior diplomats say it didn't come from bats, that Uncle Sam's military were the real corollary and they lock out Taiwan from the WHO because renminbi talks in this tale of woe. And back and forth and around they'll both swerve. Their own exoneration is all they'll preserve. A desperate tussle for geopolitical vindication. A tawdry tit-for-tat of trade war termination. While we're trapped in the middle of their lies and deceit. Their mutual meltdown of malfeasant mislead. So many seek the comfort of a familiar emphasis. Which indulges the rancor of their easy prejudice. The warped feel-good factor of having a target to aim for. A fantasized, fetishized figure that's baneful. That is a recourse they think they need not a discarnate fix for your spiritual creed. Because, friend, this is what I think. That racism they espouse is not a mark of their fear or lack of knowledge or insight. It's a base instinct that dwells inside all of us, that they've now been told is okay to run with by the leaders who gave them license, like the box of Pandora, a fetid Gomorrah, unleashed and unsilenced and released with all violence. It's not shameful anymore, in fact it's baleful of a war that's been declared in your absence, is now there and is urgent, that requires your participation, not your meditative abdication. And perhaps we can't win and we might even lose, so you have to choose whether to accept their script or go down with this ship, to beg for alliance or dance with defiance, because this could even be... The End Game. There's a time to cry, but that time is not now. There's a crime to be faced and this is not how. There's a way to be found, but it's not Tao. For the day to be one, we need to avow that now we can't hide in shadows or cow, be ruled in divide or holier than thou, cause brutality crushes you when you choke, your model minority card they revoked. If now's the climb when you choose to appease, the only rhyme you'll find is on your knees. There'll be a time for fear, but that time is not now. The price of your tears is more than Wu Mao. So brother, stand up. Take courage from your sister. Instead of victim, turn now to resistor. Black man got a lot of problems, but they don't mind throwing a brick. Asian kids go to school where they teach you how to be fair. Right. Wow. I hope everybody, everybody really enjoyed that. Thank you so much. So much love to the creative team for creating and sharing their work with us today. It was amazing. These narratives need to be raised and I hope that it's going to open up some much needed conversation uh, within our community and beyond. Okay, everybody. So we are now going to go into a five minute interval. Um, it is now one minute past four. So if we can reconvene at about uh, six minutes past four and we will go into the panel discussion. Okay, look forward to seeing you all then. Bye.
Hi everyone. Hope everybody's uh, had a little break. Come to the break. Um, welcome back to the uh, We Are Not Virus panel discussion. Um, well, my emotions and my head are still whizzing from having seen those performances, and I hope that we can take some of that strength into um, our panel discussion. First of all, if I could just ask everybody to uh, turn on the video mode and select gallery view for this section. The panel discussion is not going to be captioned, but Omnibus will share the full transcript on their platforms in a couple of weeks. Um, that will include both, both events. Uh, we have approximately 45 minutes um, in which we will open up the provocation to our panelists, and then there'll be an opportunity for you all to present questions uh, to our panel. If you want to ask a question, um, you probably all know this already by now, but if you can use the raise hand icon and then type in your question um, into the chat box. Um, or, you know, if you, if you, and then basically what we, we would, we're going to do is we're going to select the question and if, you, if your question's uh, selected, you'll be granted access to the screen where you can personally ask your question directly to the panel member or to the full panel. Um, if you don't want to do this or feel uncomfortable about doing this, then you can just type in your message and we can read out the question for you or I can read out the question for you, whatever's most comfortable. Uh, we'll try and get through as many questions as possible. Um, so we might have to edit some questions uh, coming through so we can cover as much ground as possible in, in a short time. Um, so if you can bear with us, uh, that would be great. So um, I'd like to... Uh, well, I'm thrilled to have our three pa panelists today, Dr. Dana Ye, Ash Kotak, and Gung Pham. And they're joining us to try, as we try to unpack uh, today's provocation and what it actually means and how that might manifest in a positive action that will make change. So let me introduce our panel. Uh, Dr. Ye is a senior, a senior lecturer in sociology, culture, and creative industries at City University of London. She works on race and racism, migration, cultural politics, and activism. She is author of Happy Shungs, Performing China and Struggle for Modernity, and co-editor of Contesting British Chinese Culture. She is currently principal investigator of the British Academy Leverholm funded project, Becoming East and Southeast Asian, Race, Ethnicity, and Youth Politics of Belonging. In addition, she is researching racial equalities in the creative and cultural industries via the Project Beast, British East Asians on screen and in television, and is planning a research project on COVID-19 related racial violence towards East and Southeast Asians in the UK. If you want to follow Dana's work, go to danaye.com. Next, Ash. Ash Kotak is a playwright and filmmaker. His works as a playwright include Ma, Royal Court, Hijra at uh, Bush Theatre, West Yorkshire Playhouse, Theatre du Nord in Lille, and um, a few more venues. Um, his latest film works include the Jonas's as exec producer in the, US, in the US, punched by a homosexualist as exec producer in Russia. In 2014, he founded arts curating collective Esthesia. Uh, you can find them at esthesia.org, working with dehumanized, marginalized, and disempowered communities to amplify individual voices uh, through creative arts projects. Currently, he's working on a new play entitled The AIDS Missionary and a comic called The Vulnerables. He's also developing a full-length feature film, Janu, with uh, the BFI Network and Film London. He is a graduate of Index on Censorship's Free Speech for Me 2020, uh, 2020 project to bring new voices to discussion on freedom of expression. He is an RSA fellow and graduated as a fellow of the School of Social Entrepreneurs in 2018. Guang Pham is a London-based researcher and community organizer. He is actively involved in the local East and the Southeast Asian communities, working with various local refugee and precarious communities in London. Guang is also the co-founder of Indigo Magazine, a platform for new voices in and from Southeast Asia and beyond. He also hosts a monthly show on NTS, an independent online radio platform. If you haven't had a chance to check out Gung's NTS show, you definitely should. It's brilliant. Um, you can find him at fanbinho at nts.live. Great. Let's move on. So I just want to share our topic of discussion for this evening with you all. 
how do we build solidarity across communities to combat the rise of COVID-related racism? Um, and Diana, if we could start with you and your thoughts on how we might unpack this question and through um, understanding this question, how we might begin to educate ourselves and our communities to act actively partake in collective world building through solidarity. Diana? Okay, um, thanks so much, Moy. Um, so thank you, everyone, um, especially to the artists for such incredibly powerful works and to Moongate for the incredible work you've done in pulling together this amazing set of works. And it's just like really cathartic and empowering when we all seem to be, you know, so in so much desperate need for kind of an outlet, both for anger, but also emotional nourishment. Um, so I'm thinking about this um, question for discussion about stemming the rise of um, COVID related racism, I guess it made me think about what is specific about or to COVID-19 racism and what is actually business as usual in the realm of racism, racial violence and racial inequalities. So I think like, you know, if we had this event three months ago, I think I'd be talking more specifically about the unprecedented rise of racial attacks on East and Southeast Asians, you know, and obviously the, the works curated in the show deal particularly with that. But now what's become clear is a far wider sense of crisis in terms of the disproportionate impact on COVID-19 um, on all racialized minorities in Europe and the US. So we can think about this in terms of the rates of infections and deaths. Um, you know, it's a staggering 90% of UK doctors who've died have been from racial minority backgrounds. Um, but also we can think about it in terms of job losses and in, um, um, lots of income in terms of who is being subject to the kind of new um, police powers under the coronavirus bill um, and of being unable to access health care, you know, for example, those who don't have legal status. Now, obviously, given the murder of George Floyd as well, tip of the iceberg, I think, you know, the COVID-19 story will also always be a Black Lives Matter story now and um, the struggle one of dismantling racism and imperialist structures globally. Um, so I think it really points to the necessity of building these, um, this solidarity across communities. And we need to think about who, who are those communities um, uh, you know, that, that we see ourselves aligned by. And I think we have, you know, talking about the sort of East Southeast Asian community specifically, I think we have a long way to go. Uh, one of the first things I think we need to do is to expand our political imagination. Um, so I think, you know, it was really powerful, the kind of set of works that we saw here, which really, um, where we saw glimpses into our humanity. Um, and, you know, picking up on one of the phrases here, I kind of feel like possibly I'm preaching to the choir here, but I don't actually know. So some of the issues seem to be so basic, and yet we still seem to be struggling with them. So one of them is about tackling the problem of Chineseness and Sinocentrism. So as the publicity for this event says, police figures show that hate crimes against East and Southeast Asians trebled in the first three months of 2020. Um, now, hate crime is a hugely problematic concept, which I can talk about separately. But here, what I want to highlight is that, in fact, most agencies only report figures on the Chinese. And that discourse is taken up by the state, media, and also many of our political parties, and also community discourse. So, i.e. that the racial violence is happening, um, it's anti-Chinese racism, when in fact it is, um, you know, wider East Southeast Asian communities who um, have um, been subject to the racial violence, but their experiences have completely been erased and they are con um, rendered completely invisible. So I think it's really important, like um, the, these events, um, sort of the performances today, bearing witness to the racial violences across um, the communities in a way in which Moongate's created a, a panel that really shows us how we can build broader communities as um, you know, South, East and Southeast Asians, um, but also recognize that that category doesn't encapsulate everyone who might have been um, mistaken as East and Southeast Asian, and also that the racial violence is taking um, taking place more widely on other minorities now. Um, so there's the notable case of Benny Majunga, the London transport um, worker, but also 
um, there was Mira Solanka, Solanki who was um, attacked um, for defending her Chinese friend. She was punched unconscious. We now have um, talks of Roma and traveller people being targeted with racial violence, undocumented vi um, migrants as well. There are anti-Semitic and Islamophobic conspiracy theories. So we really need to think about broadening our political imagination. The second thing I think we need to do, which I think the performance is captured really, really well, is we need to think intersectionally about who we are. So um, the work, Do My Eyes Look Small in This, um, a kind of hilarious and very accessible um, rendition of this, not only how race, but also class, gender, sexuality, religion, profession, disability, existing health conditions, migration status, all of these issues have massive effects on how an individual may experience or be able to respond to racial violence. So we need to think about who, which of the sections of the community do we need to reach out to beyond you know the group um, who might be the audiences here who needs help and i think um as well as thinking intersectionally we just need to think globally and i think this is again one of the um the, the dimensions that was really really brought out strongly in the works um i have two more points to make um the third one is we need to um, address anti-blackness and interrogate the model minority myth and the privileges that it affords to us, which creates kind of deserving and undeserving my, um, racial minorities. And Daniel's piece spoke um, so powerfully um, to this. You know, we need to recognize that the model minority stereotype is not just a stereotype, it's part of our oppression and the oppression of others, and which reinforces the racial hierarchy um, and helps us support um, white supremacist structures Structures. So um, we need to be mindful of that. And the very final thing I think is um, really what Moy says, we need to educate ourselves um, and each other and our communities about racism. Um, I think one particular thing about certain sections of the East and Southeast Asian um, communities is that we, we have a very um, basic understand of, understanding of what constitutes racism. Um, you know, it doesn't just happen on the street, it's also embedded in wider structures and um, we can inadvertently participate in it. And I think some of the ways we talk, even just saying something as simple as we Chinese, our culture, you know, this is um, a way of reifying our culture, making it fixed and unchangeable in the same way that racial discourse does. When we use phrases like the virus of racism, how, how helpful is that actually? You know, um, racism is not um, uh, something biological. Racism is social, it's structural, and it's embedded in um, our societies. It's not something you catch, it's something you participate in. Um, and I think just to kind of end slightly more positively, I hope, um, we also need to educate ourselves about the possibilities of change. Um, you know, thinking about what are our histories of activism? What can we learn from our forebears and how can we be good allies? Um, and I'd like to end with um, just citing Angela Davis, who spoke recently on Channel 4. Um, and she talked about how this moment holds possibilities for change that we have never before experienced. And I'd like to echo that, to emphasize that we need to make the most of this moment, um, as well as feeling incredibly spent by the local and global crisis over the last six months, um, as everyone is. Um, I do feel incredible momentum amongst our communities. Um, especially among the generations. And I think this event in a way it's been curated and all the work that has shown is kind of gives me um, great hope for the possibility of change. So thank you, Moi. Thanks, Saina. Thank you so much for sharing your thoughts and your, um, yeah, your experience with wisdom. It's, it's brilliant. It was really, really great. I'd like to um, just reach out to um, Ash um, to, to talk about, um, to, to talk about community and educating. Uh, a lot of your work is about advocating for new voices and freedom of expression, etc. But how, how might we go about uh, doing this educating and reaching out to communities without alienating them, without making them feel um, bad about not knowing certain things, without trying to um, place blame? But how do we galvanize um, so that we can build solidarity? I think that you're going, to go, you're going to alienate people anyhow. You're going to offend people uh, in 2020. It's very easy, easy to offend people. We have offend our own communities. Um, I've got experience of that. You can just write, you'll, ex you'll offend, I'll offend Indians by uh, just writing 
most simplest things because if you are standing up and holding a mirror to the society you come from you're going to ask very uncomfortable questions and people aren't ready for that and people it takes a, a, some generations some time uh, um, for people to change and the problem is i mean i could talk about the south asian community it can be very violent and very abusive from my experience of it mm -hmm. and so you feel very lonely when you're actually challenging um uh that community um, with David Prescott, who I can see here, we developed a play called Hydra, and it was a it was taking the form of Gujarati theatre I grew up in to talk about homosexuality. But this is twenty years ago, and it was illegal to be gay in India. I had no idea, having written that play, the attacks that would be onto me, and I wasn't strong enough. It really affected my mental health. And it's very lonely because there's very few people you can speak to because we are pioneers in many ways. We're uh, talking about new identities, new communities that we're creating in Britain. And we're asking new questions, which we belong to the past, our parents' generation. We belong to a new generation that we're creating in Britain. Well, there aren't any guides to that quite often. And therefore, when a community sometimes necessarily needs to change it can be very very violent because you're standing alone and you can have the whole community attacking you and you don't know how to deal with it i mean i could talk about my community my community plays mind games and because i'm born in britain i don't actually understand the games that will be were being played which are very common in india but i'm not from india even though i've spent so much time there i'm from britain i'm born in britain so our knowledge has to increase. We have to learn how people work in the Indian subcontinent. Um, so watching the plays today, I learned a lot because lots of things which go around in my own head. And quite often you, you can't really speak to my peers because they haven't had the same experiences. I'm slightly older. I um, have an experience of India. I have experience of East Africa. Uh, Asians as well are um, my references are very vast and uh, people are catching up and it will take time in many ways you find yourself leaders so when I watch your plays today I go wow that's what I think oh isn't it great that somebody else is saying it wow this is brilliant this is really exciting for me now this is another community therefore we have to build up solidarity within our communities because all of us are going through these same experiences and we need to gain strength from each other because when the attacks come the attacks come from within your community but they also come from the community that we live in we saw i was in trafalgar square yesterday and we saw the violence we saw the abuse that in fact, I actually spoke to some of the races. And, you know, these are the people that I would go for drinks with. You know, I recognise the kind of characters they were. And growing up in Britain, I've always had a slight uneasiness when you go into a bar, you check it out. You think, who do you need to be slightly careful of? You never, ever feel completely safe, ever. I mean, we feel... I feel much safer in London, but if you leave London, you're suddenly going into this other world and you're thinking, oh my God, what can happen? And so, um, talking to the characters, but it, these guys, this bunch of guys I went up to, now they weren't after me. They weren't racist towards me. You know, we can have a conversation, but they did say, we need to go to Trafalgar Square. We've got a job to do. Mm. And now think about that. We've got a job to do. They knew exactly wow. why they were there. They were very well organized. And so then they stood on, on uh, by Nelson's column. And then they did all of these things that I grew up in with in the 70s as a kid. And as the 80s, I haven't seen something like that. And it's mm. the language mm. that politicians use, mm. which is, empowers these people, that they stand there as proud racists. But as I said, exactly the same experience I had going from a community talking about homosexuality 20 years ago. Now, my uncle is like the most gay friendly person in the world. Oh my God, he's phoning me up, to, to, telling me about gay rights and this and that, this and that, yeah. I'm going, God, you know. Okay, but um, the point is it took that longer journey.
But when people come to the point of change, the battle is the strongest and the hardest and the toughest. Yeah. And that's exactly where we are at. And we can't do it alone. So therefore, we have to build up solidarity. You know, um, when we're talking about this, I mean, it's not even a question. I was infuriated, absolutely infuriated what has been going on and the lack of response from the politicians, from people from the East Asian community and Southeast uh, uh, Asian community were being attacked. It's appalling that this should happen in Britain in 2020. Mm. And the prime minister of the country says nothing. Therefore, of course, we have to live in solidarity, be together, and then continue having such events. I mean, brilliant work by a brilliant theatre company, by brilliant artists. This is exactly what I want to see in theatre. I'm so bored of seeing theatre does not reflect my life. I'm so bored of not challenging the abuse that so many of us go through. We need a new conversation. And yeah. that's what COVID-19 has shown me. Nothing can change. Mm. We have to move forward together. And I really hope that we can use this to move forward and work together to create something brilliant into the future, into a new Britain. Thank you, Ash. Thanks for ending on that. And thanks for sharing your thoughts. Thank you. Unmute. Sorry, I just went on mute. Um, thanks, Ash. I just want to go on to Gung and bring Gung into this um, conversation. What was interesting about what Ash touched on and, I, and, um, and Diana also mentioned in terms of her, her mention of the model minority and the types of communities that are going to be involved in this discussion, this conversation, this battle for solidarity and to, to dismantle the current um, imperialistic, uh, anti, um, sorry, black racist uh, structure. So um, Ash mentioned something about uh, the, the far right uh, community who were uh, demonstrating in Trafalgar Square and I wanted to ask you, Gung, because you do a lot of work with vulnerable communities, um, refugees who come into this country, undocumented people who, are all, who should all be part of this conversation of building solidarity. They also need to know that they are part of this conversation because they are the vulnerable. They will be the people who you know, will suffer through these um, laws and this injustice. So I wanted to ask you, Gung, in terms of like, the, in the context of solidarity and how we might be able to achieve that, can you, can you talk about how we might do that and how we might bring together the, the, the umbrella of people, all of these communities that are going to be part of this conversation because we need to educate ourselves and find a language and a vocabulary to be able to speak to everybody and bring them along with us. And when I say everybody, I don't want this to be human centric either. Of course, this is a, another conversation, but we need, we need to have a full, full conversation, a full picture, a full discussion to be able to build a strong foundation for solidarity. Gun, can you, can you expand on that a little bit? Um, so I think there's, there's something that Diana touched upon, which I wanted to also talk about was, um, uh, it ties in with anti-blackness and, and also this idea of, of Asian-ness. Um, uh, a couple of weeks ago, like Twitter went like awash with calling out um, the police officer who accompanied um, the police officer who killed um, George Floyd, the, uh, the Hmong police officer, right? And so loads of Asian Americans called him out and said, this is not my Asian. Um, and there's a really good piece which kind of like deconstructed what it meant to call these people out, right? This, these people who like subscribe to the Asian um, model minority. And essentially they're questioning whether or not these disparate communities, these fractured communities actually ever come into contact with each other, right? They are Hmong when, 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 when they fuck up, right? And they're Asian American when you want to call them out, right? Because they are not my Asian American. We are not that model minority. Now, then we also need to talk about in, in a UK context, and Diana did mention the undocumented migrants, um, who you know, a lot, we've heard, we've heard um, a couple of people that I share information with, 
um, and I've heard that uh, a lot of Vietnamese nail salon workers are afraid of going to the hospital, right? Because the, the, the information around whether or not they can access healthcare is very difficult. Um, and hospitals during this period uh, do screen people as they go in. So you can only go in if you have an appointment or if you're accompanying someone. And then you look at um, other groups that are also precarious, right? Um, Filipino domestic workers, and then um, restaurant workers who, especially Chinese restaurant workers who have been hit by these raids in Chinatown. Now, these groups are um, subjects to police violence, um, and then they're also subject to some of the problems that we have during COVID-19. Um, so we know the state won't protect them, right? With especially, and then we also got to talk about th those who have uh, precarious visas and precarious um, statuses. Um, so how do we uh, try and get these and, and bring these, galvanize these communities together in, 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 for some sort of solidarity? It's difficult because you have, um, one of the biggest problems at the moment is uh, geographical dispersal. Um, nail salon workers up right up down the country, so domestic workers, right? Um, but it's not impossible. So if you compare it to say um, Chinese takeaway workers who, uh, let's say, uh, especially 20 years ago during the foot and mouth disease, where a lot of the activists had, you, it's, it meant that you had to be in the place. We do have the benefit of technology today, right? We know by putting on the show and some of the other uh, events, the technology allows us to get together. We don't have to be in one place. We don't have to be in Trafalgar Square to protest. We can now share resources and we can donate, we can talk, we can, we can open up a space. So technology allows us to do that. Um, another thing that we need to do is have very, very difficult conversations. Um, and uh, I know a lot of friends have tried to talk about anti-blackness within their communities, um, their, their family, uh, their friends, and it's, it's very difficult, right? Because the, the immediate thing to do is turn to outrage, right? I mean, and if you're talking to your parents, the immediate thing to do is start shouting, right? That happens with a lot of immigrant families, right? Because you're, in this, you're stuck in this teenage mentality where you are, you know. Um, so, we also need to have a lot of patience. Um, it takes people a very, very long time to come round. Um, Moi, you said it the other day um, that that I, I that, that I will never stop learning, right? That I will always listen, and that's one of the things that we need to do. Um, we need to understand um, what those people who have the lived experiences are going through and what they need. Um, I'll stop there. Hey, thanks, Guang. That's um, that brought up quite a few um, thoughts for me. But I would like to invite everybody um, who's listening to uh, please share questions if you have any questions for the panel right now. Um, and if you go into your um, your chat box, you can type in your question or raise your hand, and we will get to you. Um, well, if I if I can just um, continue on from. Uh, a point that you made, Gung, and I'd like to open up to Ash and Diana as well, about talking and about learning. And that's, you know, that's perhaps, I mean, that is the, one of the most powerful tools we have at the moment is to be able to learn from each other. But what if, when we, start, when we talk about the un undocumented um, migrants or vulnerable people, you know, suddenly these, these frontline workers who are all people of, you know, um, people of color or uh, minority uh, communities, suddenly they're essential. They're so essential, they must go to work, whilst we, the privileged, can stay at home and you know, hunker down and keep safe. You know, we were, that, that rhetoric was never ever shared before, right? But I mean, that sort of language, you know, uh, and lang what language plays in the process of solidarity, uh, or finding solidarity, building solidarity, because language justice is a huge thing. These undocumented uh, uh, people and um, refugees who come in who have already are, in, are, very, are already in or find themselves in precarious situations cannot access the same information we have. So, you know, they how can, how can they be part of this solidarity? How can we how, how can we open that up? What, what, what do we do? Um, 
to do that, to make sure that it's not just people like us sitting here able to articulate ourselves in English um, and sort of leave these other people behind. Do you, does anybody have any thoughts on that? Well, I can, I mean, I don't have any really, what, what I can share with you is that, um, but this is speaking from a position as an academic. So I've just put in a funding application. Let's just hope it gets funded. But um, part of what I wanted to do, it's a project that looks at um, racial violence towards East and Southeast Asians. And part of it is academic and sociological trying to look at the extent and the scale of the racial violence across the UK because hate crime figures really don't give us um, the true picture. Um, but the other thing I'm doing is um, I'm trying to work together very closely with different organisations who work with um, various um, people within sort of different sections of our communities. So it might be um, someone who works with um, voice of domestic workers for example or it might be um people who work with um undocumented migrants or it might be people who work you know all, all the different groups and i um part of what we're trying to do or pr part of what we propose anyway is to be able to have a kind of a series of workshops um where um you know we share what we found and we learn from the experiences um, of people who participate in the workshops and it's about kind of sharing conversations and trying to learn from each other and empower our, ourselves as communities you know um by sort of learning from each other experiences and then sort of co-creating different forms of knowledge that might be able to help um communities more widely so mm. it's trying to do kind of like co-participatory knowledge production with people from different um dimensions of the community mm. that makes sense and there will be translation and interpretation um available right um if you could share that um with us diana when your new this new project um happens so that everybody it's can... only an if unfortunately oh, if. well i'm sure <laughs> it will we will we will make it happen we'll have to do a, a, another crowdfunder and just make it happen it sounds incredible um can i just uh, reiterate to our listeners that uh, we would love you to um, participate in this conversation. So if you do have a question, please raise your hand, type in your questions, and I will uh, pass them on to our brilliant panelists. Uh, we, ha we do have a question from Kieran, um, which I'd uh, like to uh, read out. It doesn't, it's not specific to any member of the, the panel. So if uh, you can take it between you and just give us some of, the, some of your feedback, that'd be great. So the question is, how do we foster solidarity amongst people of Asian identities alongside solidarity with other ethnic minorities whilst meeting the challenge of having such diversity of backgrounds, context, history in relation to racism and not erasing this diversity? As, as an example, how useful is the term BAME for our communities or the wider, or, or wider society? Can I answer that firstly? Firstly, I hate the term BAME. Mm -hmm. Now, how's, how has that come into the language? You know, it's, you know, it further dehumanizes a vast, huge group of people. I mean, the term itself is very good for studies. Mm. And if you look in Britain, you know, you've got uh, health studies, you use that term. Um, because if you look at France, you know, you don't have the same sort of uh, terminology and therefore, you know, some of these studies have just not happened in the country. So I think that's good, but actually, you know what? I'm South Asian, I'm British South Asian, I'm Gujarati, I'm Loana, I'm, my mum's East African Asian, my father's from India. I mean, the complexity of getting to me is, is huge, you know? And, and when you talk about, I mean, you know, even a problem, you know, we talk about BAME, and please never use that term. Uh, I'm asking everyone, all 65 people who have participated, never, ever, ever, ever use that term. It's horrible. So, um, so you've got um, uh, all of these differences amongst all of us, and then all we're doing is we're just bringing it all together, and it works within a system that we're we're not individuating our cultures and our own identities. And you know what theatre is about is that we 
build characters, film and theatre. And therefore, everything I saw today, it's not talking about a whole community, it's talking about an individual, mm. um, which is the character that has been written and has been performed. But then why do we have to be assumed? You see, because the problem with it is whenever I write anything, whenever I do anything, I am representing one billion South Asians in the world. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, and you know what's so ridiculous, what comes out of that is that it's South Asian culture in Britain is synonymous with Punjabi culture. And where the Indian South, the South, South Asian culture is huge and South, South Asia is huge. And you know, then we go further with that. It's like saying that the whole of European culture is Greek culture. Mm. Because that's exactly what it's like in Britain, that I can recognize the culture of the Punjabi community, but I absolutely recognize the culture from what I saw today, equally so. But it's very different from my culture, where the language is different, the script is different, the food is different, uh, you know, religion might be different, and the way we live our lives and our value systems are different. Mm. So, you know, the, our complexities are vast, and I think people in this country are ready. We see that in the restaurants which are opening up. If you look at the restaurants in the 70s and 80s, it will be South Asian food. Now, all the restaurants were actually Bangladeshi restaurants, and now you've got restaurants which are much more suited to particular cuisines. I think Britain has done a marvellous job in learning about our differences, and we've got a long way to go. It's now our job to push it forward. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Guang or Diana, would you like to um, continue any thoughts from what Ash has just shared with us? Um, yeah, so I think there's um, there's also a lot of things that once solidarity is moved going forward, right? There's also a lot of uh, uh, issues that certain Asian communities and actually communities generally still harbour some of the resentment that are tied to geopolitical demarcations, right? So there are still people, I have to give an example, I'm not calling them out, but I'll give you an example within the Vietnamese community, there's still a lot of xenophobia, for instance, right? And that gets pulled over to here in Britain, um, despite, you know, your family might be refugees and you've rejected that nation state. So there still needs to be a lot of very deep, inward looking uh, within communities and addressing some of the issues that have been harbored and mm like have been built up and they've bowled to the surface mm. which have really been ignored because for the convenience of COVID-19 or any other like activist mm. issue mm. Um, how do we do that we need to open up more spaces like this um, uh, not just public forums or within creative circles we need to open up spaces like this in our homes uh, mm. we need to talk to our friends we need to talk to our families we need to deconstruct and analyze some of the issues and why we hold these certain views. Mm. Because a lot of these views that we hold within our communities are not very different to what people have towards uh, East and Southeast Asians because of COVID-19. And so let's put that aside for the moment. I also wanted to talk about the language which you mentioned earlier, Moy, and um, this is something which, uh, so just for context, myself, I speak Vietnamese to a, a, a very high level, um, but I'm, I'm struggling a lot with the conversations around race and anti-blackness, right? Because a lot of the language that is used to code certain things have only been recently invented, right? Microaggression, anti-blackness, gaslighting, unconscious um, bias. These are words which can be translated word for word into another language, but it's very difficult. And it also relies on the listener to understand that word, right? Mm -hmm. um, I'm part of uh, an online group whereby now we're trying to find some sort of um, workshop where we do try and analyze words. And so it allows us to have these conversations without falling into like general, um, I guess like, is quite large terms where we're just saying oh it's racism but what type of racism is it right mm. we need to really we need to identify it from the very to the, to the specificity of what we're talking about mm. and from identifying it then we're able to move forward um so yeah. those are the two things i wanted to really address it, it really i mean i think it really it really feels like what um is staring us in the face and confronting us is this um 
educate I mean it's about educating and so if I were to to like what you were just listing there and and um, pointing out Gung that there are lots of words that perhaps don't have the correct or a nuanced translation into different language languages which would help us be able to communicate with um, our extended community and our family you know um, but then if we think about the lack of knowledge about our histories and our interconnected histories which we are not taught about in British schools they omit them in the curriculum the pedagogical system just whitewashed um, I think that that's a big problem for us in in the UK you know because if we were to if we had the opportunity to to learn the history and how the history inter, you know it relates and connects and and the consequences of those em, em, empire uh, dominated situations and exploitations, we would feel more connected and understand. And I'm wondering whether that might then help us foster this solidarity that, that, that uh, solidarity that Kieran refers to, it's about educating. So do we need to start a new dictionary of words or, or we just need to hijack the curriculum? We, we need to hijack the curriculum and teach, teach each other things. Um, can I just go to a dancer's uh, question, uh, last question, because we're running out of time, everybody. But um, and this is again to um, it, it feel to no one in specific. So if the, the panel can um, take it between them. So uh, Dan asks, it's been striking to notice that SE and East Asians are regularly overlooked when talking about racism in the UK. In the last three, three weeks, much of the UK and USA me mainstream media regularly and explicitly report headlines of racism as something that ha mainly happens to black and brown people. Why do you think this is? I think this is such a good question. Um, and, uh, you know, Kathy Park Hong talks about um, invisible racism and that people don't even believe us when we say that there is racism towards East Asian, Southeast Asian, South Asian. You know, they don't believe it exists. They think it is a black and brown, black and white um, uh, discussion. What can what can uh, the panel add to this? It's well, I mean, absolutely. <laughs> it really kind of follows on very well with the kind of comments that you've been making so far about the curriculum and the need to recognise imperialist histories, because this kind of erasure of East and Southeast Asians comes directly out of that. It's um, because Britain never had the same kind of colonial relationships with East and Southeast Asian communities. So China was only ever sort of like colonizing sort of small parts um, and it never had that same kind of relationship so therefore and then East and Southeast Asia is just like completely invisible it's just not in the British imagination at all okay. um, so I think those come together really really nicely I think also um, there's something about um, the way in which East and Southeast Asians are constructed as a model minority as well that that's um, construct this idea that we do not experience racism um, and we are somehow impervious to racism because supposedly all of us, which is completely obviously not true, all of us um, are supposed to perform very well in education and be uh, do very well in terms of um, the economy. Um, so there's kind of very narrow idea of what constitutes um, racism, I think, but it mm. definitely comes from the colonial history. Yeah. I would agree. I would definitely agree. Gung or Ash, can you can you add to this? The um, I would say one thing. I think there's two things that have come out of which have come to the top of my head. Have come out of um, COVID nineteen related racism. Um, I found, especially when talking to friends and family members who aren't really involved in creative circles or who discuss these issues, and there's always been. A denial that this happens we, even within uh, east and southeast asian communities covid19 has now given us that example right i know it's a horrible time for it to be but it gives us that example but also um number two there's also a recognition that we need to um acknowledge is that this isn't just a blip this isn't just um something that's come out of nowhere it comes in a long history of racism in Britain, um, stretching back over a hundred years. It will continue for a very long time after this. We might get a vaccine tomorrow in a, in a year, but the racism will still be there, right? And the, the violent and the non-aggressive violent racism is just, is, is, is the most 
is, the, is, is at the top of the pyramid, right? But then we need to address all the other issues that gets coded in racial language, right? Mm -hmm. Structural inequality, right? The, the, the casual racism, right? The voice has been silent on TV, uh, British East and East Southeast Asians. We need to then address those issues. Unfortunately, this gives us a distraction, but also it gives us some sort of evidence to say, right, it is happening today in Britain. Um, so those are the two things which are, are really important to remember. Mm. Can I add something Ash, quick? There? Please do. Can you um, can you wrap us up, Ash? <laughs> um, okay. Um, one of the things that we're asking the question is that if people don't actually, if people, what I found this year, starting with COVID nineteen and Black Lives Matter. Mm. I found that a lot of people are unaware of their racism. And online, I have read by people who should know better, the most offensive language used. And for the whole year, and you know, it's, I mean, I've, I'm going to lose friendships over this because you know, if you can't speak to people, there's no point. And I've, we all have, we've blocked a lot of people. So I think what's important about theatre is we create theatre, which really, really sometimes is uncomfortable, which asks people to challenge their own racism because everyone's got prejudice within them. And it's all very well for people to say, no, it's not me. But I don't think that's true. And I think that we really, really need to now step forward and say, ask people, and people will have to ask themselves, is it me and why? And I think that's the next journey we're going on to um, post what's happened this year. Thank you, Ash. That's a really strong statement to um, end with. I would say, uh, just to uh, reiterate some of that, um, your um, what you're saying is that yes, um, and there are a couple of questions about why uh, racism to certain groups of, um, to certain communities is marginal and how do we change that? So I think you're right in that we need, it's a time for reflection, but it's also a time for action. We need to, we need to speak up. You can find what, you know, whatever voice it is that best suits you, but we need to speak up and be visible. It doesn't, you know, it can be in any language, but I think that's uh, what we need to do now is to claim back that space stand on those plinths that have been, you know, t uh, where those statues that shouldn't have zit been there anyway, they've been torn down. Let's get on that, elevate and talk. And, and you know that we've got your back. We're going to support you. Whatever you say, you know, it's just, we need to make this uh, conversation heard. Um, unfortunately, we can't get through any more questions. We're, we're coming to the end of um, the discussion. Um, I'd, I'd like to thank our panel, um, Dr. Diana Ye, um, Ash Kotak and Gung Pham. Thanks so much for joining us and for sharing your thoughts with us today. Um, I'm sure this conversation will continue and I, I really hope uh, it will continue um, and we will get more voices into, into this discussion and that we're going to continue this work because we have a lot of work to do. Um, but thank you so much, so, so much. I can't wait to see you in, in person and uh, we'll raise a glass. But thank you uh, for joining us. Um, I'd like to say some thank yous before we, uh, we go. Um, first of all, of course, thank you to all of the performers, writers who have contributed valuable love and time to creating this amazing, the amazing work that we've experienced together on this event. Um, thank you for the, all the brilliant East Asian talents, Southeast Asian talents, South Asian talents, human beings who have been behind the scene involved in making this, uh, this event happen. We need more. Um, uh, on behalf of Moongate, I'd like to thank Omnibus Theatre and Arts Council Emergency Fund. Um, big shout out to Ellie and Kai. Just to let you all know also that both events have uh, been recorded and will be captioned. These will be available for two weeks to view again on the Omnibus website for people who were not able to attend today. So please share this with our community so that they can um, experience this work um, and get up to date and educate on what we've, we've, we've started talking about in this discussion. Um, 
I'd like also to remind you all that our industry has been detrimentally impacted by the pandemic, including the brilliant Omnibus Theatre who have supported us. Um, so if any of you are in a position to donate and support them, they have a now do li uh, donate link uh, to help them continue their brilliant work. I wonder if we can share that in the um, chat box. But if not, it's, uh, you can find them on www.nowdonate.com and it's Omnibus Theatre. There you go, it's up there. Please help if you can. Um, uh, another important uh, piece of information I'd really like to share with everybody is that all proceeds from We Are Not Virus is being donated to Black Lives Matter and their fund. And some of our brilliant creators have also donated their fees. So thank you, and that's the start to building solidarity. Um, we also, uh, I'd also like to uh, remind everybody uh, that we remember the people we lost in uh, Grenfell. This is the third anniversary. We will not forget. And we need to find justice for those people. And that means everybody standing up for each other. Um, on behalf of the team, I'd like to thank you all for joining, supporting us. Just being here, showing solidarity, giving your time. And I don't know how you feel, but this feels good. And I want to keep this feeling going. So let's keep this conversation, conversation alive and full of energy. Um, finally, I'd just like to close with a quote from uh, a brilliant collective uh, who uh, are based in New York called the Asian American Feminist Collective. They have a website. You should check them out. They have a podcast. Uh, amazing women who are doing amazing work. Uh, but I'd like to share a quote uh, from them to everybody as uh, we end this event. And I hope it will, we can take it away and we can um, digest it and then make make things better for us all. In this moment, we also see how revolutionary love and care can reshape our world. We see the urgency, necessity, and radical possibilities of decarceration, language justice, healthcare and housing access, economic redistribution, and mutual aid. Our dreams, visions, and desires for an alternative world and future can be realized. We are made of communities with deep collective knowledge on how to care for each other and the earth around us. Together, we can survive and build interdependent communities of resistance. Sending much love to everybody. Thank you so much for joining. Thank you, Moongate. Thank you, Omnibus. Thank you, brilliant panel. Um, see you all soon. Thank you. Thank you, Moi.